Okay, our last problem here, uh, our in-class problem, deals with um, rate-limiting reactions that have a fast initial step. So when we have a fast initial step, um, remember our demonstration from class, um, we had somebody who was clipping papers together, and they could do this very quickly, about one per second. And then our next person was the person who was taking those papers apart. And when they take those papers apart, they can only do that once every 10 seconds. So what we'd see here when we have a, uh, a slow second step, a fast initial step, is our rate's going to be limited by that second step. When our bottleneck occurs later on, that allows for intermediates to accumulate. So there was a pile of these clipped papers that was accumulating because they could accumulate at a rate of one per second. They could only get unclipped by our second person once every 10 seconds. So intermediates always accumulate. There's this concept of a waiting line for intermediates to be used up in a second step. And importantly, in these kind of reactions, that waiting line allows for reversibility of this first step. Okay, so that allows for a forward and a reverse rate. We can have some of those intermediates decompose back to our starting materials. So the rate law for these kind of reactions are much more complicated. So as an example here, we're going to run through the uh, reaction that takes two molecules of NO, reacts them with a molecule of O2, and generates two molecules of NO2. So just kind of by looking at this, we could probably make the initial assumption that this probably occurs via a multi-step reaction. Because if we consider this to be an elementary step, it would be termolecular. And that's not very common for that to happen, for three molecules to simultaneously come together. So that's kind of a good indication that this might occur via a multi-step mechanism. So here again is a proposed mechanism for how this might occur. The first um, elementary step being NO reacting with O2 to generate the intermediate NO3. In the second elementary step, that intermediate NO3 is used up by reacting with the second molecule of NO to generate the two product molecules of NO2. Now, in the proposed mechanism, this is proposing that the first step is fast and thus reversible because it's limited by this slow second step. Remember, when we're validating a mechanism, we're always going to have an experimentally determined or actual factual rate law, and that's what's given here. So validating a mechanism, again, involves three steps. The first is asking, do the elementary steps sum to the overall balanced equation? So taking a look at that, again, here's our overall balanced equation. We have our first elementary step, second elementary step. We can see that NO3 as an intermediate appears as the product of the first elementary step and is used up as a reactant in the second elementary step. We have two molecules of NO involved as reactants in both elementary steps, the first and the second. So we get 2NO. We use up O2 in our first elementary step and then again generating two products. So yes. Our elementary steps do sum to the overall balanced equation. Again, are the elementary steps reasonable, unimolecular or bimolecular? We've got two bimolecular elementary steps, so that is valid. And again, we looked at our initial reaction and said, you know what, I don't think that's a single elementary step because that would be termolecular, not really valid. So the next thing we need to do to validate a mechanism is ask if the proposed mechanism correlates with the rate law. And really looking at this another way is asking, is the rate law for the slow step equal to the observed rate law? If we want to validate our mechanism, the, the rate law for the slow step must match the experimentally observed rate law. Right? So if we're proposing this to be the slow step, the rate law equals the rate constant times the concentration of each species, that's a reactant, raised to powers that are coefficients. Remember, we can do that for an elementary step. So here is our proposed rate law for the slow step. Here's our experimentally observed rate law. These do not match. And so because they don't match, right now it appears that the proposed mechanism does not correlate with the rate law. 
But there's a few things that are a problem with looking at it this way, right? In our slow initial step problem, the rate of the slow step matched the observed rate law. For this problem, the rate law for the second step does not, and we should say, does not appear to match the observed rate law. And here's a couple reasons why. NO3 and intermediate is in the second step rate law, but not in the observed rate law. So we see things that appear in our rate law for our proposed uh, slow step, but we don't see them in the actual one. And then again, O2 is not in the second step rate law, but is in the observed rate law. So again, things that appear in our um, rate law for our slow step, but don't appear in the actual, and things that appear in the actual, but not in our slow step. So there has to be some way of reconciling that in order to validate and see if the mechanism is valid. So it says here, don't worry, math and an understanding of equilibrium can resolve this apparent inconsistency. So how do we think about um, an understanding of equilibrium kind of helping with this? Well, that gets into rate laws for the first elementary step. Remember, we said that that first elementary step was going to be reversible, that reversibility set up by the waiting line for the accumulation of those intermediates. So really, the first elementary step is two steps. It's a forward reaction that takes NO with O2 and makes NO3, and it's a reversal of that, where now NO3 is acting as a reactant, decomposing back to the reactants, uh, the original reactants, NO and O2. So we really can write two rate laws for that elementary step, that first elementary step. The rate law for the forward reaction, so that's as we have written here, rate constant times the concentration of NO times the concentration of O2. Again, no coefficients here, so we don't have to worry about exponents there. For the reverse of that, right, now we're going to be treating NO3 as the reactant, so rate equals rate constant times the concentration of NO3. No coefficient there. But you'll notice that when we're talking about a reverse rate constant, we put a little minus there to remind us that that's the case. All right, so how do we then reconcile and the fact that this does not appear, this slow step does not appear to match this, but as we'll show with some equilibrium and math, it actually does. All right, so let's move forward and see if this makes sense. At equilibrium, so what it means to be at equilibrium is forward and reverse rates are equal. We'll learn a lot more about that in our next chapter, but that's what equilibrium means forward and reverse rates are equal so that there's no net change. So when the forward and the reverse rates are equal, we can actually set these two rate laws equal to one another, okay? And that's going to allow us to substitute in for NO3 since we don't want NO3 to appear in our rate law. All right, so again, if we're saying that at equilibrium, so at equilibrium, these rates are equal, that means we can set the right-hand portion equal, okay? So this guy is going to be equal to this guy, okay? Now we're going to do a little algebra and we're going to rearrange for this quantity. So we're going to rearrange and solve for NO3. So rearranging and solving for NO3 means all of this stuff is still in the numerator, but K minus one goes in the denominator. All right, so why is this important? This is gonna allow us to get rid of this guy in the rate law for our second step, because we don't want it. We don't want intermediates in our rate law. So again, substituting this new expression for NO3 into our slow step rate law generates a revised raise rate law. So again, if we put this guy in here, here was our rate law, for our second elementary step. So we're gonna take this guy and we're gonna put it in right there. So K2 stays the same, NO stays the same, but we put this guy in right here, okay? So what that allows us to do now, right? Simplifying this, we get K2, K1, and K minus one, right? And what we're really gonna do is this is just combining, this is one big K. So rate equals the rate constant times the NO2 squared times O2. Wow, lo and behold, this does match the observed rate law. 
So that means this mechanism is consistent. So we set up here the rate law for the second step. This did not appear to be consistent with the observed rate law. But once we consider equilibrium and we consider some algebraic substitution for a quantity that's not supposed to be in our rate law, we do see that it does match the observed rate law. So I know that problem was a little bit dicey to get into. So again, another video you might need to watch a couple of times to make sure that you understand the aspects of this. Still doing the same three things to validate a mechanism. We need to have things sum to the overall balanced equation, make sure that elementary steps are only unimolecular, bimolecular. But in answering the question, does the proposed mechanism correlate with the rate law? That is, is the rate law for the slow step the observed rate law? Because that rate law for the slow second step involves intermediates, we need to use aspects of equilibrium to substitute out this quantity because we don't want it in our, um, our rate, our rate uh, law there. Going through assumptions with equilibrium that allow us to do that substitution shows us that our proposed mechanism and the rate law for the slow step does match the observed rate law complicated problem, but a great way to end chapter 16.